Okay, good morning everyone. I'd just like to firstly welcome you to the 2018 Children's Tumour Foundation Neurofibromatosis Community Information Seminar. Okay, we've got some fantastic speakers today. I'd firstly like to go through a few things with you. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, on which we are meeting today, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Okay. There's a couple of housekeeping things I'll run through with you first before we get started. Um, and firstly, is that if you're needing the toilets, there's some out the door here and then round to the left. And upstairs and behind this, uh, this auditorium in, on level one, um, there are some toilets along the corridor towards the lounge where we'll be having morning tea, afternoon tea and lunch. Talking of lunch, if anyone's needing gluten-free options, can you please make sure that you let the girls at the registration desk know before or at morning tea? Um, they will then source those options for you for lunch. Okay, there is stuff there for morning tea and afternoon tea if it's needed. Okay. Um, okay. So, aside from that, I would like to then welcome John Hughes, the chairman uh, and interim CEO of the Children's Tumour Foundation, who will be chairing the day for us. Uh, as we would like to have done. No. But 
why aren't you doing this? And why aren't you doing that? There could be no one more frustrated about that than me. But unfortunately, we can only do the best we can what we've got. If anyone here today has an idea about what we can do as an organisation, or more importantly, what you can do as community members, help us raise money. Every dollar counts in our So whatever you can do, your little part in your local community, every part of that can help us. Because we've got about 10,000 people impacted by CPF Australia wide. So how many families is that? And just think if you multiply that by $100 a year. Okay, looks like we're... Well, John, thank you very much. It's been um, a great pleasure during the course of these past several days to uh, meet people here, many of them old friends, um, but many people I hadn't met before. One thing I learned, John, is you do a better U.S. Southern accent than I do. Um, and as you pointed out, that's not where I'm originally from, but I was um, I moved to Birmingham, Alabama about 15 years ago um, to set up a new department of genetics there and to establish an NF program on site there as well. Well, I was asked to comment today about genomics of NF. Um, here is um, more specifically uh, what I'll cover. Um, I'll define for you what we mean by a gene and, and genomics first and foremost, and make some comments about genetic testing. It's possible that some of you have um, had genetic testing done um, in yourselves or members of your family. Um, I'll try to give you a sense of what one can learn from that, what one doesn't learn from that, for example. I'll talk also a bit about clinical trials um, that are going on uh, for NF, um, realizing that isn't strictly speaking genomics, but in fact it's genomics that has provided the insights that allow us to do clinical trials. So I'll try to give you a sense of what's going on in the world of therapeutics, and then end with um, a few comments about what I think may be the future of care for individuals with neurofibromatosis. Let me begin just by recalling for you the classification of neurofibromatosis. It's really a term that encompasses three distinct conditions, um, NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. The reason they're all called neurofibromatosis is that years back, decades back really, uh, what was noticed by clinicians was that 
tumors form along the course of nerves in all three of these conditions. And a long time back, it wasn't so easy to tell the difference between the kind of tumors that they were. And so they were all sort of grouped together under the term neurofibromatosis. Then as the years passed, as genetic studies were done, as better technologies were available to study the tumors, all of these things led to realizing that there were really three distinct clinically different conditions. Um, so neurofibromatosis type 1, um, which is depicted on the um, far left, produces a number of signs on the skin that probably many of you are familiar with, cafe au lait spots, flat brown spots on the skin, uh, skin nodules that are neurofibromas, the benign tumors that arise from nerves that can occur anywhere in the body but might be most visible on the skin. And then many other things, um, tumors of the optic pathway, so-called optic glioma, problems in the way bones form that can lead to fracture, for example, of the leg bones, um, curvature of the spine, learning disabilities. You'll hear from other people today, I think, about some of these specific manifestations. And we now know that the gene which is responsible for NF1 is located on chromosome 17. And I'll say a good bit more about this in just the next few minutes. NF type 2, in contrast, causes tumors of the hearing nerve. This is an MRI scan, the scalp, the brain. You can even see the ear on two sides. And these are tumors of the hearing nerve called vestibular schwannomas which are the defining feature of NF type 2. But many other tumors occur as well. Meningiomas, um, which are not shown here, but would appear as tumors um, around the membranes um, covering the brain or spinal cord. Schwannomas, tumors of the nerve sheath, which are distinct from neurofibromas that can occur anywhere, including along the spine. And then the third condition, schwannomatosis, causes these tumors, schwannomas, that can occur um, literally on any nerve, except usually, for some reason, not on the hearing nerve, which distinguishes schwannomatosis for, from NF2. It wasn't known to exist until maybe a few, I guess now decades ago, and pain is the hallmark feature of schwannomatosis. People with this condition tend to develop significant pain. I can point with this, it might be easier. The genes for NF2 and schwannomatosis are actually clustered together on chromosome 22. So the NF2 gene is there. Uh, there are two genes, one called SMARC-B1 and one called LZTR1, that account for schwannomatosis. Um, in any one individual, it will be one or the other. And it's interesting that these are all clustered in the same region, and that probably has something to do with the way the schwannomas form. Uh, but in any case, these are completely distinct disorders. Um, NF1 never turns into NF2. Some people have asked us that question. Um, once I was asked if um, two parents have NF1, would a child have NF2? Which is kind of a logical question when you think about it, but no, it doesn't work that way. Um, the condition will be the same uh, from one generation to the next. All three of these display what we call dominant genetic inheritance. That means that an affected person has a 50% chance of passing the altered gene on to any offspring. This would apply to NF1, NF2, or schwannomatosis. So a parent who's affected has a 50-50 chance of passing the gene to the next generation. But also true for all three of these conditions, there is a high rate of new genetic mutation or alteration. That is, in the sperm cell or egg cell, a mutation arises in a person who, him or herself, doesn't have any form of NF, but then a child will inherit that from the parent, and it'll turn out then that from that point on in the family, NF will be established. So this child may be the first affected person in the family, but faces then in turn a 50% chance of passing NF to the next generation. These all have what we call complete penetrance, which means that if you carry the gene change, you will show signs of it, except Schwannomatosis, that may be less true, but NF1 and NF2 does not skip generations. If you have the gene change, it should be fairly easy to tell. So let me now get into a little bit about genetic testing and um, start with just a kind of quick review of what we're talking about when we talk about a gene to begin with. As you probably know, 
genes are encoded in the molecule DNA, uh, which exists within all of our cells in the cell nucleus. And the DNA essentially is a kind of recipe that tells the cell how to make various proteins, one of which is the NF1 protein, another of which the protein involved in NF2, and so on. The code that translates the information in DNA into a protein is, um, consists of four letters, A, T, C, and G, and the words that make up the building blocks of the protein are three-letter words. GCA tells the cell to insert an amino acid, which is a building block of a protein called alanine. If the code says AGA, it inserts an arginine. And so these building blocks are strung together to form an individual specific protein, and it's the sequence of letters of the genetic code that tell the cell how to make any particular protein, including those involved in NF. So what is a genetic mutation or gene alteration? And to give you a, a sense of that, let me use this example, which obviously is not um, from genetics. But remember I said a minute ago that the letters comprise three, or the genetic code consists of three-letter words. So here's a, a sentence that obviously consists of three-letter words. And let's take a look at what happens when changes occur in these letters. Realize, by the way, that the human genetic code is like three billion letters long. And you can get neurofibromatosis from having just one incorrect letter out of three billion, which might, on the surface, sound almost impossible. But here's how it happens. Suppose the D got changed to an H. New sentence says the biped is hog. Well, it's a logical sentence, but it isn't correct. It's not telling you what really happened. We can have a deletion. The word pet has been eliminated from the sentence. The boy, his dog, tells you nothing. You don't really know why somebody is pointing out the boy and his dog. Or there can be an insertion. In this case, this ing, the boy, ing, pet, his dog, makes no sense. Can't figure out what the writer is trying to say. This one's a little bit um, more subtle, where you can have um, deletions I'm thinking back to the boy pet his dog. If I take the Y out here and reassort these into three-letter words, just pushing the P where the Y was and so on, you get this complete nonsense. And that's what happens when a single letter of the genetic code is eliminated. Um, what is read by the cell makes no sense at all. The same would occur if I inserted a letter here. It reassorts these three letters, and you get a complete nonsense sentence. So the main point here is that what might appear to you to be very subtle changes can have very profound effects. Um, just like it changes the meaning of the sentence, so it changes what the cell reads. So genetic testing now is available for NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. Uh, what you're looking at here is a map of the NF1 gene. That's what the gray thick bar is here. All the little markings below are different genetic mutations that have been found in different individuals with NF1 over the course of many years. This slide was, by the way, provided by Dr. Ludwin Messian, who runs the lab where, for many years, it was the lab that was used by people all over the world for genetic testing because they were uh, really the first to get this done in an efficient way. These days, there are other labs that offer it as well, but I think this is still the kind of gold standard lab internationally. The little um, vertical letters are another different type of mutation, not too important to worry about what it is. These bars indicate deletions within the gene. The main point to be made here is how complicated it is. Um, almost no two people have the same genetic alteration. At last count, we had seen more than 3,000 different gene mutations in the NF1 gene, um, different from one person to the next. But the lab has now worked it out pretty efficiently, and we can almost always find the genetic alteration if the question arises. And this applies equally well to NF2. Schwannomatosis is a little bit more difficult. Um, the two genes, SMARC-B1 and LZTR1 I mentioned, uh, both of those are at this point um, not accounting for every one of the affected individuals, so there are probably more to be learned here. 
For the most part, you can't predict exactly how NF will affect a person based on the mutation. There's one particular tiny mutation which seems to give a very mild form where you only get the cafe au lait spots and learning disabilities, but none of the tumors. It's an exceedingly rare mutation, but an important one to recognize. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there are people who have their entire gene missing. We've marked it here in red and green on this chromosome, and here it's missing on the other chromosome. The green just marks the chromosome. And these people tend to have a pretty severe set of manifestations, a very large number of neurofibromas, early onset, and um, intellectual disabilities. These are IQ scores of people with um, the deletion, uh, and they tend to be on the low end of the scale. Um, so it's a pretty severe set of manifestations, rare, pretty easy to detect clinically, actually, um, because people look different. They tend to be pretty tall, which is not typical for NF1. Usually people with NF1, if anything, are shorter than average. There's a third form called spinal NF where you get a very large number of neurofibromas. This is an MRI scan, and every spinal nerve, sometimes nerves down into the leg, massively enlarged. You see these almost beads on a string appearance on the skin, but you don't usually see many cafe au lait spots or skin fold freckles or cutaneous skin neurofibromas in this entity. And there are some particular mutations we've learned that cause that. That all being said, for the most part, you can't predict how NF will behave from looking at the gene mutation. So you can identify the mutation, and the condition tends to vary so much from one person to the next, it would be difficult to say exactly what manifestations to expect in any given individual. So that raises the question of when do we do genetic testing? Should everybody have genetic testing? And my answer is not necessarily. And even in our center, which probably has the best access to genetic testing anywhere, given that the lab is, is actually was at one time and is still near um, the same building where our patients are seen, uh, we only send it in particular circumstances. Um, the first is uh, when a child is um, seen in our clinic who has just multiple cafe au lait spots and no other signs of NF. And that's usually how NF first presents, NF type 1, that is. And in those settings, if we wait long enough, usually it will become obvious if the child is affected, but many parents prefer to know sooner than later just for their peace of mind. Um, there is another condition called Legius syndrome due to genetic alteration in a different gene, and all it seems to produce are cafe au lait spots, skin fold freckles, and learning disabilities, but none of the tumors. And although it's a rare condition compared with NF1, families are also interested in knowing whether that might be happening. Uh, so we'll offer the testing to the um, child or to, through the parents to the child um, with just cafe au lait spots. We occasionally, you know, seeing some of the more complicated sort of clinical problems, we'll see somebody where the diagnosis is being considered, but it's not 100% certain. Sometimes that's due to a phenomenon called mosaicism, where the genetic alteration arose during early development, and the person literally has a mixture of cells in their body, some with an NF mutation, some not. And they can have sometimes very mild signs of NF. Other times, the NF will be confined just to one region of the body, like an arm or a leg, and nowhere else. And we might offer testing to resolve that. If we suspect the whole gene deletion that I described a few minutes ago or the spinal NF, I do usually get genetic testing because both of those require some extra care in clinical follow-up. And finally, realizing this is a condition that a person has a 50% chance of transmitting to any future offspring, many people are interested in genetic counseling, potentially even prenatal diagnosis to determine if the gene has been passed on. And that's fairly straightforward to do now. If you know the genetic alteration in the parent, you can get um, cells from the developing fetus, either by amniocentesis between 15 and 18 weeks of pregnancy, or by chorionic villus sampling, which can be done between 10 and 12 weeks. And it's even possible to do what's called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where a number of egg cells are obtained from the mother. Uh, you do in vitro fertilization, let the embryos reach about the eight-cell stage. You can remove one cell 
from the embryo, test it, determine if it carries the mutation, and then implant back into the mother the embryos that do not have the mutation. It's a pretty expensive thing to do, but it is feasible. So let me um, switch gears a little bit now and um, say something about you know, what can be done to treat NF based on this understanding. Now I'm going to say this um, next few slides will be focusing on NF1, but some of the same discussion could apply to NF2. Um, all these genes are so-called tumor suppressor genes. What that means is that a person is born with two copies of every gene, including this one, and if you have neurofibromatosis, one copy is in its normal state, and the other copy has um, a mutation. It's either been inherited from a parent or it arose for the first time in the sperm or the egg, but either way, um, every cell in the body, unless a person is a mosaic, as I described before, um, will carry this mutation. So plus minus means one intact copy, one mutated copy. Actually, this would equally apply to NF2. The way a neurofibroma happens, or for that matter, a schwannoma in NF2, is the other copy of the gene undergoes mutation. Now, that might strike you as a kind of unlikely thing, but it turns out gene mutations are happening all the time in all of us. It's a natural thing. It's not due to any particular cause. It's just a kind of an error in the way the, the genetic material is copied. When you think of the fact that you've got three billion letters of the genetic code to copy every time a cell divide, it's not that surprising occasionally. It's like making a typographical error copying a large book. But in any case, if that mutation happens to be in the NF1 gene, if you have NF1 or in the NF2 gene or in one of the genes involved in schwannomatosis, the outcome is the cell has no functioning copy. It's depicted here as minus minus. Okay. Now, for most people who have an, two intact copies of the NF gene, if one gets mutated that way in a cell, you're not going to know it because that cell probably won't have um, very much success in dividing and doesn't usually cause any problem. But if you have already one mutated copy and you lose the other one, that gets you in trouble. Simple way to think about this is imagine the front and rear brakes of a car, okay, and they're independent systems. And you know when you drive a car, it's not likely, but possible that the front or the rear brakes will fail, but it's really unlikely that both will fail at the same time. If, it, if that had any likelihood, nobody would be willing to drive a car. But having NF is a little bit like somebody selling you a car and saying, well, the front brakes don't work, but don't worry, the rear brakes are fine. You wouldn't buy such a car if that opportunity arose without at least getting the brakes fixed. So having NF is like permanently having one set of brakes not working, and sooner or later, the other set may well fail, and that's what leads to a tumor. And so it does. And there's signaling between cells that in turn helps to kind of um, get these tumors growing. This applies equally well in NF2 and schwannomatosis. Malignant tumors, which are mostly a phenomenon of NF1, happen when these cells undergo additional genetic changes. So with that as a background... What could one imagine doing to treat? So here's the same thing I just depicted, except um, in words. You'd like to be able to prevent that second mutation. We call it a second hit sometimes from happening. But right now, I don't know that there's a, an obvious way to do it. Maybe we could figure out a way to turn the gene back on if it's been altered by mutation. As you'll see in a minute, the way the NF1 gene works is it has a regulatory role in signaling in the cell through a protein called RAS. And that's been pretty successful, actually, so far in modulating RAS signaling or signaling between cells. So here's, for NF1, what's actually going on. The NF1 gene product, or protein, is shown here. There's another protein called RAS, and it sits right inside the cell membrane. Picture, if you will, an antenna that pierces the cell membrane and has one end sticking out into the periphery. And this red ball is a signal that's been sent, like a hormone maybe, that binds to this antenna. And when it does, it sends a signal into the cell. And this activates RAS, shown here by the fact that it's in green. And when that happens, it binds a molecule called GTP. Well, what that does is it sets up a kind of domino effect of signals that eventually find their way into the cell nucleus, 
turning on genes needed to make the cell divide. NF1 turns out to be a regulator of this process. You might say, well, once the cell's been told to divide, how does it know when to stop? And the answer is NF1 tells it when to stop. Problem is, if you're missing NF1 function, then when RAS has been stimulated, there's nothing to prevent it from just continually causing the cell to divide, and that's where neurofibroma comes from. And it's somewhat similar. It's not RAS, but a different pathway would act in NF2, and I don't think we fully understand the pathways involved in schwannomatosis. So this domino effect lends itself to the possibility maybe you could block it put something in the way, and prevent that signal from getting to the nucleus. And that's been the focus of a lot of the effort so far in terms of trying to develop therapeutics for NF. And in particular, there's been pretty good success with drugs called MEK inhibitors. MEK just stands for the name of the protein that is part of this signaling cascade. And there's been a trial at the National Cancer Institute in the U.S. going on for a few years now, this is a patient of mine who's been treated, and I show this picture with the permission of his family. In fact, um, if you do a search on selumetinib and NF, I guarantee you this picture will show up online. His family has been very forthcoming um, because uh, they really have been, um, I think, very happy with the way things have gone. This is a tumor that um, he has that we noticed when he was very young. It's pretty easy to see, really hard when you would touch it. He's been on selumetinib, which is a MEK inhibitor, for a few years now, and here's a more recent picture, and you can barely see it. You probably wouldn't know it was there if you didn't know what to look for. This is a growth curve of his tumor, so from the point when we first noticed it, it was growing pretty um, linearly um, and went from 50 um, milliliters or cc's to almost 200, quadrupling in size. And then the red is where he started selumetinib. And you can see the tumor plummeted to about half of its size. It's more or less plateaued now. It hasn't totally disappeared. Um, but it's gotten, um, you know, 50% reduction in size is, is pretty good. And I can tell you he and his family are pretty happy. Um, the drug has, for him, been um, tolerable to take. And he has um, really benefited remarkably. So... Right now, this is not an FDA-approved drug in the U.S., or for that matter, as far as I know, anywhere in the world. There are other drugs that are MEK inhibitors, however, that are approved for use, including here. And there are people that have been put on these other MEK inhibitors, also with um, some reduction in plexiform neurofibroma growth. So that's been a major um, kind of um, change in the way things happen. Uh, we at UAB are now testing this drug for cutaneous neurofibromas. If it works so well for the larger plexiforms, would it work for the smaller skin neurofibromas? Now, it's not possible uh, from, for um, all of you to participate in this study. It requires physically being present um, at our site at UAB or at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, but nonetheless, you should know we're testing this, and if it works, then this drug would be widely available, we hope, eventually. The big picture of clinical trials involves phase one, two, three, and four studies. A phase one study is usually just designed to determine if the drug is safe and what the acceptable dosage is. Um, that needs to be done as a prelude before any trial is done. Most of the NF trials are phase two trials, testing to see if the drug works. Phase three is more often done in settings of common disease where you can recruit thousands of people. That's a pretty hard thing to do in NF. So most of the rare disease trials end at stage at phase two. And if those end up working, it is possible to get the drugs approved for clinical use. And then there's a continual marketing, um, post-marketing survey uh, monitoring for side effects. Uh, for the past now, 12 or 13 years, we've had a clinical trials consortium. It's funded by the Department of Defense, actually, in the U.S. I know you don't um, normally think of the U.S. Army as funding NF research, and we can talk at the break if you want to understand why they are. Uh, but nonetheless, um, actually a few hundred million dollars over the last 20 years have been put into NF research. Um, this consortium, actually, is mostly in the U.S., except actually uh, Children's Hospital at Westmead in Sydney, and now here in Melbourne are part of this uh, through Dr. North. So um, this is a consortium that 
does exist here in Australia. Um, right now we have something like 23, 24 sites. We've done many clinical trials. One of them that was actually run from the group here in Australia we called STARS, testing lovastatin uh, to see if it would help with learning disabilities. Unfortunately, it did not. But it was an important trial to do because after some work in the mouse suggesting maybe it would work, um, some people were putting their children on this, which means exposing them to side effects. We've done a plexiform neurofibroma trial, a glioma trial, and also uh, a trial for malignancies. The second phase of the award, its second five years, did include a trial for NF2, which is still ongoing, so we don't have results to report. A couple of trials uh, for plexiform neurofibroma, and then a bunch also for uh, sarcomas and one for tibial pseudoarthrosis, the bone dysplasia. And now we're working on our third cycle. There'll be two trials for plexiform neurofibromas. Uh, this one's up and running. This one just about to start. Um, a pain trial for schwannomatosis and another drug trial for NF2 vestibular schwannomas. There are a lot of drugs now that are in the pipeline that we hope will be able to be tested at some point. That was for NF1. This is for NF2. If you want to find out about ongoing trials, probably the most authoritative source is clinicaltrials.gov. Um, we try to keep track of these in our own site uh, for the NF consortium and the U.S. Army program URL is shown here too. What we've been working on in our own um, department is to see if we can find ways to turn the gene back on if it's been damaged by mutation. We're following the lead of cystic fibrosis, a completely separate disorder that maybe you've heard of. Um, it affects the lung and digestion especially. And there are drugs now that will turn this um, membrane channel back on after it's been damaged by mutation. These are people, their lung function after treatment compared to people not treated. Without knowing anything more, you can see a big difference here at least. And this is now an FDA-approved drug, and it literally turns on the damaged um, protein. And so it's something we've been asking, could we do an NF? And um, looking at the spectrum of mutations, I told you there are 3,000 plus different mutations, but that doesn't mean we need 3,000 different drugs. Uh, we can classify these in kind of different bins and hopefully drugs that will work for um, big chunks of um, these mutations can be identified. We're doing a lot in the area of um, animal models, um, trying to put human mutations into mouse or rat or various other settings and um, several of these now have been validated and serve as models. Our kind of dream is what you might call the development of patient avatars. You figure out a person's mutation. You make what are called IPS cells. These are induced pluripotent stem cells. We heard yesterday of a um, group here doing this, um, something we've been doing in Birmingham as well. You can create animal models. It's a pretty time-consuming thing, making a mouse model, though we've done that. Zebrafish are a common model to use. They're pretty quick and easy to work with. And then what you do is um, you test a given individual's cells or the cells from a model of that individual's mutation to see which drug works best, do drug testing to identify a compound that would work for that person, and then it goes back into the individual. So that's kind of the kind of big picture, long-term future that we're aiming for. Many people ask, since there's been a lot of publicity about genome editing. Can you go in and fix the mutation in the cell? Uh, the system that is used for editing is called CRISPR-Cas9. It's basically a big protein. That's what this kind of blob here is meant to show. And it um, zeroes in on a particular sequence of DNA, makes a cut, and then can repair it. So in theory, sure. In fact, we use it all the time to create the animal models. And we actually do have a grant. In fact, we just learned we got it funded yesterday, um, where we'll be looking at nanoparticles to kind of target particular cell types and see if we can go in and edit the gene. But I'll say before um, you know, leading to um, unrealistic sort of expectations, it's going to take a long time uh, to validate that. Um, but if you don't start, you won't get there. So that's um, an area uh, that we're very excited about. But I realize it's going to be a significant journey. Let me just end with um, kind of a 
bit of speculation maybe about where things may be going. And in particular, I want to kind of make the point um, that there needs to be a transition from patients to partners in care. Um, one of the questions we often get is, how do you find an NF clinic? I think you're fortunate here in, in Melbourne, those that come from um, Sydney, I think, as well. Um, there are really world-class NF clinics. Um, the question in general, though, becomes complicated when you live far away from such a clinic. Uh, how do you know that a clinic is really able to provide the kind of care that you need? You can look at whether they have experience with seeing a large number of patients. It's nice to think that they might be publishing papers about it, telling you that it's an area of special interest. Uh, do they participate in clinical trials? And, you know, I can't read my own slide here. It shows white on white. Um, not sure why that is. Um, but you want to know that they're a specialist that they have access to and um, the kind of services that they're providing to patients. So that's easy to say. I realize not always so easy to do. Children's Tumor Foundation in the U.S. maintains a listing of NF clinics. I don't know if something similar exists here or not, but it's been a useful resource. We're in process now of developing an app. This one has nothing to do with NF. I learned about it when my daughter um, uh, was having a baby, and she could tell me at any time during pregnancy or afterwards when the baby was born exactly what the baby should be doing or what the fetus looked like. Um, and I asked her how she knew that. And it turned out, well, there was an app for that, and um, this is the one she was using. It kind of made me think, well, if there's an app to tell you what to expect your child to be doing um, developmentally, maybe there could be an app that would tell you what to expect of your child or even of yourself in terms of NF. And, you know, when should you be worried? When is it not so worrisome? And so we're actually working with a company now uh, to create an educational app that I hope will do exactly that. There's a lot of networking that goes on. I think that is exemplified by your being here, but I know that there are a lot of um, social media sites. This one, Patients Like Me, is one example where people learn from each other and can share experience. I think there's a real opportunity for the clinics to be in the business of data sharing, and it's something I think would be great to see on a larger scale so that we can begin, as we provide care, to also be learning from what we do. Uh, so, Where's the future of NF care? And I would answer that it may be three specific things. One is what I would call smart surveillance. Can we tailor the way we follow people to the, in <clears throat> to the individual, uh, knowing their genetic mutation, maybe knowing something about their tumor burden, and not just treating everybody the same, but personalizing treatment so that we actually customize how we take care of somebody based on what we know they're specifically at risk for? Um, collecting data along the way so that we can guide the treatment and provide just the right amount of surveillance and not go overboard. You don't want to have your life be ruled by always making appointments for the next test if it's not a test that's really going to be useful for you. And having sort of just-in-time um, knowledge of what to expect and what to provide. Targeting treatments, tailoring them as best possible, uh, for the individual so that they target the particular problem that they're dealing with and minimize the number of side effects, and community building, including support from one another, um, trying to collect data, uh, trying to make sure people have access to the care that they need. And finally, let me just um, point out that um, if you're interested in more information, there's lots of sources. Um, the CTF in the U.S., I think, has a, an excellent uh, resource, I expect, here as well. Um, there are things you can be looking at. I'll just mention that um, for the past few years, I've um, maintained on the UABNF um, website, the URL for which is shown here, a blog, um, commenting on things going on in the world of NF, including um, things happening in national meetings, as well as um, some of the scientific advances. The last few blogs I commented in some detail on the um, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics guidelines for adult care um, with NF1. But it's, it's another way to sort of keep up on what's going on. And actually, if you were to tune in soon, I have a feeling we'll be commenting some on this visit to Australia. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, end and um, just want to say thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to uh, meet so many of you here. We'll stick around for the morning and be glad to, um, to chat individually. 
Um, I'll maybe end with just a comment that the outlook for people with any of the forms of NF now has never been brighter. I can't claim that we've solved any of the issues. Uh, but as you've seen, I think there have been areas of real progress, um, certainly more in the past few years than in the 35, actually, it's been uh, since I first started seeing individuals with neurofibromatosis. And I'll say for sure, for a child born today, the outlook in terms of therapeutics is, is much, much brighter than it ever was historically. Don't use the experience of a present-day adult to predict what the future of a child is. But even for present-day adults, there is hope that we'll have better treatments in the years to come. Thanks very much. Great. Um, thank you, John. We've just got a couple of minutes for questions for Professor Korf, if you would like to ask anything. Um, so, yep. Daniel's down here with a microphone and he'll run that to you. 
if you stick your hand up and please I'll leave that to you to Okay, sure. If no one else will. Um, are we doing the right thing targeting GPs? Um, well, who are the main carers in everyday life of people with NF in the US? Is it the GPs or are they adult physicians? Well, you know, I think what you're doing is trying to um, target the clinicians who might be the kind of first point of contact for people. And um, I think it really is important for them to be more aware. Now, you know, it's not realistic to expect them to be experts on NF because the number of people in their practice affected is bound to be pretty small. So they won't probably have a learning curve just based on that. But helping them to recognize NF when they see it and to be at least alert to some of the warning signs. Like, for example, in NF1, one of the things we always look for is unexplained pain because that can be the presenting sign of a malignant change of a neurofibroma. Not always a sign of malignancy, but it's possible it is. And, you know, we've experienced instances where somebody would be seen by their general practitioner and they don't recognize the importance of that and they tend to you know, treat it conservatively, and by the time it finally um, becomes obvious something is going on, the tumor has advanced a fair bit. So it's really worth trying to educate um, general practitioners, but, you know, with the realistic knowledge that what you really want them to do is recognize the kind of major signs and then be prepared to partner with an expert who can actually provide the kind of detailed care that's needed. So you're talking about recognising in a person with NF1 that unexplained pain could be a red flag? For example, but okay. a, you could say the same for NF2, that you know, hearing changes would be something to be alert to and okay. to realise. So it's mostly knowing what are some of the kind of danger signs that mm. require further attention. And for that matter, of course, recognising the diagnosis to Itself. begin with. Thank you. Um, I'm asking about spinal NF and NF1 because I've got neurofibromas in every bit of my spine and they don't grow on the nerve, they grow in the nerve and they rip the nerves apart. And I just want to know if NF1 is related to spinal NF. Yeah. yeah, spinal NF is a particular, you might say, variety of NF1 or it's a, bit, a particular way NF1 can behave. Now, people with NF1 can have spinal neurofibromas. So... If you have the skin neurofibromas and all the more kind of common signs of NF, it's entirely possible that you'll also have neurofibromas along the spine. Spinal NF itself as an entity is due to changes in the NF1 gene. So it's the same gene, but there are slightly different changes. And the thing that distinguishes it is that you actually usually don't see the neurofibromas on the skin. In fact, you don't much see anything on the skin um, but internally, you can have a very large number of neurofibromas, especially on the spine, actually not only. So that, yes, it's a variety of NF1. Um, and like I said, anybody with NF1 can get spinal tumors. It's the presence of spinal tumors without skin tumors that defines spinal NF, though. Well, I wouldn't say you have both. I would just say if you have neurofibromas on the skin as well as neurofibromas on the spine, that happens in NF1. Um, I wouldn't call it spinal NF. Again, spinal NF is what happens when you get an unusually large burden of spinal tumors but nothing on the skin. Um, I just had a question about the trials that have taken place in the U.S. and um, whether you can say anything about uh, side effects from the new medications, um, in particular, if it's uh, if there's any concerns about it affecting the fertility of the patients. Yeah. So the um, side, if I presume you're referring specifically to the MEK inhibitors like selumetinib, and the answer there is that yes, the drugs do have side effects. Um, the most common side effects are on the skin. A lot of people develop a skin rash. Uh, they, it can be a red um, sort of scaling skin rash that's itchy. Uh, some develop acne-like um, skin changes as well. These are manageable uh, both by adjusting the dosage of the medicine as well as um, using other medications. 
There are side effects um, both on the heart and on the eye which can occur. Those are monitored really closely and if there's any evidence of those beginning to occur, usually the drug is stopped, um, at least temporarily. They are reversible, um, at least in the heart. Um, and we haven't really seen any of the eye effects. I think um, with the current dosing regimens, those do not occur very often, but we do monitor carefully for those. But to your question about fertility, that is not a concern with MEK inhibitors. Um, I guess main reason why is that, you know, standard chemotherapy, the kind of thing you might use to treat cancers, including, for example, optic gliomas in NF1, um, function by killing cells, and many of the drug, drugs in question do it by interfering with the replication of DNA within the cell. And one of the side effects sometimes is causing mutations or damage to germ cells, which is what limits fertility in people who have had chemotherapy for cancer. The MEK inhibitors are not that kind of drug. They don't kill cells actually at all, and they don't affect the genetic material. So there's no reason, at least known to me at this point, to predict that the MEK inhibitors would have an effect on fertility. They do have side effects, but that as far as I'm aware, is not one of them.